Hello everyone, this is me Prajamlo from AZ Academy. So today I'll be solving a physics paper of A-level physics, which is October, November 2022, variant 41. The subject code is 9702. And this is paper 4. Um, and this exam is for 2 hours. So I'll be moving on to our first question. So the first question is a question from gravitational fields. So let's read the first question. State the equation for the gravitational force if between two point masses, M1 and M2, that are separated by the distance r. State the meaning of any other symbols which you use. So we know that the equation for gravitational force between two point masses is F equals to G M1 M2 by, um, by R squared. They have given that R is small r and the two point masses are M1 and M2, hence we are using M1 and M2 here. Since they have already defined these symbols for us, M1, M2 and R, See, they have said that masses m1 and m2 and separated by the distance r. So these are already defined by the question. So we just have to uh, define the symbol which we introduced here in the equation, which is basically capital G. So capital G over here, we know, is the gravitational constant. Okay. So that's it. Now let's move on to the second part, which is part B. So the satellite is in a circular orbit of radius capital R around the planet of mass capital M. State, uh, show that the period T of the orbit is given by T squared equals to K R cube, which is the capital R cube. Where K is a constant and depends on the value of M, explain your reason. Okay, so over here, since they have said that the satellite is in a circular orbit, then we can easily say that this circular orbit is provided by the gravitational force because gravitational force over here is providing the centripetal force. So we can write that FG equals to FC, where FG is the gravitational force, which is providing our centripetal force. So FG is capital G MM by R square. Um, since they have asked us to use capital M and capital R, so we are going to use capital R here, sorry. And uh, FC is our centripetal force, which is NV square by capital R. Uh, since they have asked us to relate to time, so we shall rather use the other equation, which is M omega square R. Okay, over here, we can see that the small M's are getting cancelled out. So now, uh, we can write G capital M equals to omega square R2, basically taking it to the other side. Now, uh, uh, we can substitute omega as 2 pi by t, because we know omega is 2 pi by t. 2 pi is the complete revolution angle, which is 360 degrees, and t is the time period. They have already said that uh, period is t. Okay, so... Let's substitute 2 pi by t in omega r cube. So gm, uh, if we break it down, it covers 4 pi square by t square r cube. Now, uh, now let's bring, uh, let's make t the subject because t square is the subject here. So if we bring t square and the other side of the equation, t squared there, that will give us 4 pi square by gm times r cube. Now we know this whole thing can be made a constant because 4 is a constant, pi is a constant, g is a gravitational constant, m is also a constant because m is not going to change. And also they have said that uh, the value of k depends on the m. So we can uh, as the uh, uh, we can say this whole thing as k. And we know as they have said that the value of k depends on m. This means if m increases, if n increases, then k is going to decrease. And if m decreases, then k will increase. Okay. So we can just now write t square equals to k i cube because this whole thing is a constant and k is the other constant which defines this. Okay, and this is basically what they have asked us to show in the question. So we are just going to write show. Okay, so that's the first part of the question done. Okay, now the next part, it says the satellite is in a circular orbit around the Earth with a period of 24 hours, which is a d. Uh, the mass of the Earth is 610 times the power 24 kilograms. Uh, calculate the radius of the orbit. So we can just directly make use of this equation which we derived, which is t square equals to over here, uh, which we derived here, t square equals to 4 pi square, 4 pi square and gm times r cube. Okay, so over here, uh, we can say r equals to cube root of uh, t square times gm by 4 pi square. And over here, they've given us a mass. So we are just going to substitute 6.0 to the power 24 in the place of mass. And t is 24 hours. So 24 times 60 times 60. Okay, this converts it to minute and this converts it to second. Or we can directly write 24 times 3600, 
which is the conversion of hours to seconds. Okay, now if we substitute these values in the equation, sorry, now if we substitute these values in the equation, then it's going to give us 4.2 times 10 to the power 7, which is our answer. Okay, 4.2 times 10 to the power 7 meters since it's the radius. Okay. Okay, now let's move on to the next part. It says state two other conditions that must be met for an orbit to be geostationary. So we know the conditions for an orbit to be geostationary that or that satellite needs to be always above the equator. Then it needs to revolve from uh, west to east always. And also its period shall be 24 hours. So these are some of the things, but they've already mentioned that the satellite has a circular orbit around the earth which has a period of 24 hours. So we cannot just repeat this point over here. So that's why it's not included in the marriage scale. So we are going to have to write about the other points, which is it is always above the equator. And we can write direction of direction is always from west to east. Okay. So these are some of the common points about geostation and satellite. You can also find these points directly in our A-level physics syllabus. Okay. Okay, anyways, now moving on to the next question, which is question number two, which is from thermal physics. Okay, let's start. Over here, in the second question, it says, figure 2.1 shows a laboratory thermometer that has been calibrated to measure the temperature in degrees Celsius. The thermometer makes use of the fact of the density of mercury varies with temperature. Okay, so we know this is one of the thermometric properties through which a thermometer can be um, made from and can be calibrated against. Okay. Now, uh, part A of the question says that state two other physical properties of materials apart from the density of liquid that can be used for measuring the temperature. So this is a pretty common thing. So you have to know some of the properties of materials that allows us to design thermometers. So over here you can say resistance of uh, metal or you can write about the volume of a gas at constant pressure. So these are some of the points which you'll find in your book or anywhere else uh, for notes for thermophysics. So yes, so you can write uh, volume of gas at constant pressure. I'm gonna also talk about the EMF of a thermocouple because you guys have seen the use of thermocouple thermometers where we make the use of EMF. Okay, so we can also write about the EMF of thermocouple thermometers. Thermocouple. Okay. Okay, anyway, so moving on to the next part. The thermometer is initially at 23 degrees Celsius, as shown in figure 2.1. It is used to measure the temperature of an insulated beaker of water at 37.4 degrees Celsius. The bulb of the thermometer is inserted into the water and the water is stirred until the reading of the thermometers becomes steady. So basically, uh, from this scenario, we can understand that they're talking about thermal equilibrium. Okay, because uh, this means that one is at a lower temperature and this one is at a higher temperature. So basically what happens is that the bulb of a thermometer is inserted into the water and over here for example we can imagine this scenario as there is water so and initially the thermometer reading has 23 degrees celsius and then what happens is that once you insert the bulb of this thermometer into this water what happens is that the water's temperature is higher at 37.4 degrees celsius and thermometer has an initial temperature of 23.0 degrees Celsius. So basically what will happen is thermal energy is going to flow in from hotter temperature to cooler temperature. And this is going to happen until thermal equilibrium is reached. And we know that thermal equilibrium is reached at a steady temperature. So this is basically what is happening. A heat transfer is happening between the water and the bulb of the thermometer and the thermometer until the temperature on both sides become constant. Okay. Now let's see what they have said, extra information which they have given us in oppression. This is the mass of the water in the beaker is 18.7 grams. The mass of mercury in thermocouple is seven point, uh, sorry, 6.94 grams. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joule per gram per Kelvin. And the specific heat capacity of mercury is 14 point, uh, sorry, 0 0.140 joule per gram per Kelvin. The glass of the thermometer and the beaker containing the water can be considered to have negligible heat capacity. Okay, so this means we do not have to consider the beaker and uh, beaker containing the water. Okay, and the glass of the thermocouple. So this can be just ignored in this uh, whole thing. Okay, now calculate to three significant figures. So this is important that they are asking us to calculate in three significant figures. So we shouldn't be using anything else. 
uh, the final steady temperature that uh, that is indicated by the thermometer in the water. So over here, uh, what we can design is we can design two equations. So for the thermometer, uh, we can write thermometer's bulb, I shall say, uh, which contains a mercury as mc del theta. And also uh, we can, uh, for the water, also we can also write mc del theta. Over here, this is the specific heat capacity of water. Over here, this is what thermometer we can say. And mass is also of mercury. So mercury can be written as HG, which is a symbol for mercury, and for water it's W we can say. Okay. So anyway, so what we can basically do since we are trying to achieve thermal equilibrium, that means the energy will be equal at one point. So basically that is the point we're trying to reach and we need to find the temperature at that point. So we can just equate MC uh, del theta equals to MC del theta. One is of the water and one is of the thermometer. Okay. So on this side, we can write it for water and this side, let's just make it for mercury. Okay. Now, if we substitute the values they have given us already. So mass is 18.7 grams for water. So 18.7. Oh, let's divide it by 1000. And the specific heat capacity is in 4.11 joule 1.8. So 4.18. Since these are all in the same units, so actually you do not even have to convert the units. But I'm still doing it for the mass. Okay, no, I shouldn't be doing it for the rest because I'm taking a specific heat capacity in grams, so no need to divide it. Okay, so 18.7 times specific heat capacity for water. So this is the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18, the 4.18, and the temperature of the water. So temperature of the water is going to over here, as you can see, it was initially 37.4, so it's going to decrease to a temperature because as the thermal transfer takes place, the temperature of water must decrease because it goes from higher temperature to lower temperature. So the steady temperature shall be lower than 37.4 degrees Celsius and higher than 23.0. Okay. Anyway, since the temperature is decreasing, so we can write 34. Point, uh, sorry, the final the uh, the temperature was 37.4. 37.4 minus T this is the because this is uh, considering the change in temperature since the Final temperature is lower, so our change is normally positive. So we're going to write 37.4 minus T. This will give us a positive change so that the energy over here is positive value is obtained. Otherwise, the answer will come wrong. And whereas for mercury, the mass of mercury is given as 6.94 grams. So 6.94. The specific heat capacity for mercury is given as 0 0.140. 0 0.140 into the change in temperature over here the final temperature is higher so this final temperature is higher so we're going to subtract from the final temperature the initial temperature which is which was 23 degrees celsius okay now uh if we do the math so over here if we do 18.7 times 4.18 4.18 times 37.4 that gives us 2923.4084 minus uh, why does let's just I'm doing it in my calculator minus 78.1660 and over here if we calculate then this is going to give us 0 0.97160 T minus uh, if we multiply by 23 that gives me 22.3468 okay now if we solve for T we're going to get a value of 37.2 degrees Celsius which is our final temperature so let's just write this 37.2 degrees also. Okay. So anyway, so moving on to our next question. So just one other change. So uh, so for the last question, it was just reaching thermal equilibrium. Okay. Anyways, so just one other change that could be made for the design of the uh, to the design of the thermometer that would enable it to give a more accurate measurement of the temperature. So over here, over here, we can see that uh, thermal transfer is taking place in the first question, and the temperature which is obtained is 37.2. And the temperature of the water, actual temperature of the water is 37.4. And over here, we can see that the masses are very much comparable. And how can we, why is this mass, why is this, sorry, temperature so similar? This is because the specific heat capacity of mercury is very low compared to water. Or in general, the specific heat capacity of mercury is very low. See, this value is very low once you're multiplying it over here on this side. This is going to give us uh, like the temperature over here. So this uh, 
um, this constant along with t is very small. So as a result, what we're getting once we are moving it to the other side and getting the vinyl value is very low. So as a result, this is basically because the uh, specific heat capacity of mercury is very low. So now if we want to get even more accurate temperature, we need to make the use of a material that has an even lower specific heat capacity. Okay, so now uh, in this question, specific, uh, basically we just have to say that we are going to use a liquid of a lower specific heat capacity. So use, sorry, let's try to move, use a liquid of a lower specific heat capacity. Heat capacity, or small c. Okay. And one more thing which you can also do is even if we reduce the mass of the mercury which is being used, that will also decrease uh, this coefficient on this side. Okay. So we can also uh, write over here that use a smaller mass of mercury. So they are also accepting these in the y case here. Okay. Using a smaller mass of mercury or let's just write whole mercury. Okay, so in this way, we can reduce this side of our equation and this will result in a much more accurate reading of the temperature. The lower the this side of the, uh, the right-hand side of our calculation over here, uh, the much more closer the temperature is to the original value, which is 37.4. Over here, it's too close because mercury is pretty good because it has a low specific heat capacity and usually we use a smaller mass. If we, if we, if we use even smaller mass, then the temperature would have been even more accurate. Okay. So now let's move on to the next part. Explain why the thermometer in figure 2.1 does not provide a direct measurement of the thermodynamic temperature. Okay, this is because a simple reason which you can say is that it depends on the property of the thermometric substance. Okay, and it is not zero degree Celsius is not absolute zero. So when we uh, calibrate the thermometer, we basically are calibrating against known temperatures. So basically, for example, we can uh, keep it in ice and we are going to measure zero degree Celsius. And then if we use boiling water, then it's going to be 100. So we are basically measuring it in degree Celsius. But in general, the thermodynamic temperature, when we talk about thermodynamic temperature, in general, it's in Kelvin. So as a result, there is a difference in the units which we are doing. So we can say that zero degree Celsius is not absolute zero. Okay, absolute zero or which is basically zero Kelvin. Okay, and it also we can say that does not provide a direct measurement of the thermodynamic temperature because it depends on the properties of real substances. Okay, so it depends on the property of real substances. Okay, now moving on to the next part. In the next part, it says the thermodynamic temperature T can be determined by using the behavior of a dipole substance, but T is proportional to the value of pressure and uh, pressure and volume, uh, to the product of pressure and volume. So we can just say directly from this question that it is talking about ideal gases because we know the equation for ideal gases equals to PV equals to NRT. NRT is N and R are constants. So we can write PV is proportional to T or which is the same as T is proportional to the product of P and V. So it's basically ideal gas. Simple answer. Okay. So it says an object is suspended from a spring. So we can say that this is a simple harmonic motion question. Okay. So the object is suspended from a spring and is attached to a fixed wire as shown in figure 3.1. So this is the object. This is a fixed wire to which it is attached to and it is suspended over here from the spring. And this is the oscillation which is occurring. So it's, it's a simple harmonic question. Anyways. The object oscillates vertically with a simple harmonic motion about the equilibrium position. Okay. Set the defining equation for simple harmonic motion. Identify the meaning of each and every symbols which you uh, represent a uh, physical quantity. So over here we know the equation for simple harmonic motion is A equals to minus omega square x. And over here A refers to the acceleration. And x refers to the displacement from the equilibrium position. Displacement from the equilibrium position. Position and over here, omega is basically referring to the angular frequency. Okay, so this is a basic definition which you guys follow. Now, moving on to our next question. The variation for displacement x from the equilibrium position and velocity v of the object is shown in figure 3.2. The variation in x of potential energy, E, B, or the oscillations of the algae is shown in figure 3.3. Okay. 
use figure 3.2 and 3.3 to find out the amplitude of the oscillation. So let's just find it from the first figure. So over here we can see 0 as the normal point and over here is extending up to 0 0.12 meters which is the maximum uh, displacement from the initial position we can say. So we can directly write 0 0.12 meter here. Also from the second figure we can see that the maximum displacement which it is going from the equilibrium position is 0.12 so that is our displacement. Anyways, now it says show that the angular frequency of the oscillation is 1.7 uh, radian per second so angular frequency is basically omega which is 2 pi by d. So let's just go to the graph and see the time period. Okay. Okay, sorry, I think there are no time periods, but we can, we also know, uh, uh, we can calculate it somewhere else, some in some other way as well. So we know at maximum speed, v0 equals to omega x0, which is uh, the given equation. So you can also find it in the formula sheet, which gives us the, another equation, but we can easily derive it from here. So for example, where is it? Okay, so from this equation basically, so at maximum velocity, uh, it is equal to the amplitude and x square is 0. So omega and this is amplitude square. So v0 equals to omega x0. Okay, v0 equals to omega x0. So we can directly derive it from the formula booklet as well by chance if we forget. So anyways, so using this equation, uh, we also have the graph to provide us with information. So let's go to the graph over here. We have seen that uh, the maximum velocity or v0 is 0 0.2. So let's just substitute uh, 0 0.2 for v0 equals to omega into x0. Over here, we have already found x0 as 0 0.12. So 0 0.12 over here, if we calculate, we, it's going to give us 1.7 rad per second in two significant figures. So it's showing. Okay. Now it says determine the mass of the object M. Okay. So mass of the object. So basically, we need to take help from these graphs, which they have given us. So what we can do is that uh, they have given us information about the EP, which is the potential energy. So over here we can say that the maximum potential energy is 0 0.05. So we can make use of this specific information here. So we know E can be written as half m omega square x dot square. So over here we have seen that the maximum EP over here is 0 0.05. So let's just substitute 0 0.05. So wh why we can take uh, the maximum EP as our maximum energy? This is because at maximum EP, uh, we can say that the kinetic energy is zero. Okay, the maximum EP occurs when it is in the highest position. So when this will travel up and move to a higher position over here, initially the V will be zero. So as a result, on the highest position, we can say EK as zero and EP is max. So over here, if we calculate the total energy, this is EK plus EP, which is kinetic energy and potential energy. This is zero. So total energy will be equal to our potential energy. So that's why we can make use of this equation. So we can directly write as a maximum energy as 0 0.05 and half. Um, uh, we have to basically find out capital M from here. And omega, we have already seen in as 1.7 from the last word and x dot as we know 0 0.12 0 0.12 square now if we calculate m from here this is going to give us 2.5 kilograms uh, to significant figures so that's our answer okay now moving on to our next part it says the oscillation of the object is now lightly damped explain the meaning of damping so damping is basically the loss of total energy of a system due to resistive forces so loss of total energy of a system due to resistive forces. These, these are very common definitions which you have to remember. Okay, now let's move on to our next part. It says assume that the damping does not change the angular frequency of the oscillation. So let's just write omega is constant head because angular frequency is not changing. This is important. Okay. Now sketch the variation with x and v of the amplitude of the oscillation is 0 0.06. So basically omega is constant. That means over here there is no relationship with omega. So the frequency is not going to change. So they've only uh, said that uh, the amplitude is changing to 0 
and they're asking us to draw it on the same figure. So everything is going to be the same almost because the angular frequency is constant. So, and just the amplitude is going to be 0 0.06. So let's move on to figure 3.2. So this is 3.2. Let's just find a 0 0.06 over here. So uh, we can see these as 0 0.04. So these are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 boxes. So 0 0.04 by 10. So, okay, we do not even have to calculate the number because it's basically in the middle. So 0 0.06 is the, in the middle of 0 0.08 and 0 0.04 because this is basically the midpoint. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is basically 0 0.06. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yep, this is the midpoint. Okay, I don't know. Let's find zero, minus 0 0.06 here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is minus 0 0.06. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yep, that's the midpoint. Okay, so now basically what we have to do is that we have we need to find V as well because let's just see. Let's just calculate V. So over here we know V equals e equals to omega um, x naught square minus x square and we have already seen at x naught V is maximal. So V equals to omega x naught. So they have said that omega is constant. So we can write V equals to x naught. Oh, sorry. So let's just uh, find out V. So uh, 1.7 is omega, which I've already found out. And X has been decreased to 0 by 0 0.06. So 0 0.06. So from here, this gives us the new V. Yes, let me just calculate 1.7 times 0 0.06. That gives me 0 0.102. So it's somewhere near 0 0.1. Okay. Uh, since it's 0 next. So over here is 10 boxes. So it's close to 0 0.1. It's, it's slightly higher, but we can just write it as 0 0.1. Okay. Okay. So over here is 0 0.1 and negative 0 0.1. So what we basically have to do is draw a uh, sort of the similar shape as they have given us. So a cycle because the amplitude has been decreased and the velocity has also decreased. It's three found out over here. So uh, as angular frequency is constant. So let's just try to draw a cycle like them. It's not exactly a sorry fault, but uh, it's like a slanted round thingy. Okay, anyways, <laughs> let's just draw it here. Uh, so yeah, that's roughly the shape which you are going to get. Okay, so that's it for our third question. Now I'm moving on to our next question. State what is indicated by the direction of an electric field. So we know the direction of an electric field mainly are field lines because electric fields are shown by field lines and they mainly show the direction of force on a positive charge. So you have to know this. So these are, so they show the direction of force. They show the direction of force on, or you can just write acting on a positive charge, acting on a positive charge. Because whenever we are using test charges, we make the use of positive charge when it comes to electric field. So that's why. So electric field lines. So these are the field lines. So these field lines mainly show the direction of force acting on a positive charge. For example, if we have a positive charge on an electric field, then these lines, these are the field lines. And this is basically, these will basically show the direction of force acting on a positive charge. Okay. Next. Part B, it says figure 4.1 shows a pair of parallel metal pins with a potential difference of 2400 volts between them. So this is the potential difference, which you didn't see, 2400 here and 0 volts here. The plates are separated by a distance of 4.6 centimeter. Over here, you can see 4.6 centimeter. And the plates are invecting. On figure 4.1, draw five lines to represent the electric field in the region between the plates. So we know. For electric fields, they, they are going to be basically straight lines. And we know it uh, goes from positive to negative. Or since over here, this is zero potential and this is a positive potential. So the field lines will mainly come from positive to the zero volt potential. And you need to make sure that these are completely straight lines so that they are 90 degrees because they come out at 90 degree angles. Okay. Now they're saying to draw five lines. So we are basically going to draw five equidistant lines because since these are parallel plates, these electric field strength inside the uh, inside these both plates will be equal. Okay, so let's just draw these lines. So they must be equally spaced. Okay, so this gap and this gap between the lines shall be equal. Okay, let me draw a bit there. Okay, yep. 
So these gaps must be equal. So we are we should be drawing five lines because they have asked us to draw five lines. So basically, if you draw these five lines, you're going to score the full marks. Okay. So the marks come from these three points. So firstly, you need to show that then arrow for the dower that will score you one mark. The zeely firmly spaced lines are going to score you another one mark. And the lines shall be straight or perpendicular. Okay, these straight lines, this scores you one mark perpendicular. Uniformly spaced scores you another mark. And the downward pointing arrow scores you another mark. Okay, pretty easy three marks here. Okay, now moving on to the next part. Calculate the strength of electric field between the blades. Now, we know since these are parallel blades, so we have to make use of the formula, which is electric field strength equals to the potential difference or voltage divided by the distance between them. The distance is given to us as 4.6 centimeter, and the potential difference is basically 2400 volts, which is basically the difference in potential between these two plates. Okay, so E equals to 2400 divided by 4.6 centimeters, so 4.6 times into the bar minus 3 because we're into meters. So now, if you put this in a calculator, you're going to get an answer of 5.2 times into the bar 4 newton per group. So 5.2 times into the bar 4. Okay, so that is it for this part of the question. Next part, part C, it says a moving photon enters the region between the blades from left as shown in figure 4.2. So this is a proton which is entering. Part 1 says the proton is reflected by the electric field. Yes, obviously, because the proton is positively charged. So this is basically going to get attracted toward the zero volt, which is less positive. And obviously, the proton will be repelled by the more positive 2400 volts, so it will be moving downward. Now it says, draw on draw on figure 4.2, draw a line to show the path of the proton as it moves through and out of the region of the electric pulse. So it must also move out of the electric pulse. So for example, if the proton enters here, for example, the proton is entering the electric field like this, and like this, it will go out. Basically, it will get deflected downward because the proton is attracted toward the more negative part since there is no negative so it is less positive then upward this upward region is much more positive way more positively charged hence it will repel the protons and the proton will be attracted to the less positive region it's mainly attracted to the negative region over here is zero volt so it's basically getting deflected by the positive charges on top and it will move downward like this okay so basically you have to show a curve and the deflection should be downward that will score you the max here Next, it says a helium nucleus, H is due for it. So this is our helium nucleus, for example, now enters. It's, being, it's just the nucleus. It's, it doesn't have any electrons, so you have to take care of that. So helium nucleus mainly consists of two protons and two neutrons. And the total uniform atomic mass is four. Okay, so this, we can say this is the RMM or MR as four. And it has two protons, which is the atomic number. Okay. Now the path of the proton along the same initial path as the proton are traveling at the same initial speed. So let's just mark it. It's traveling at the same initial speed. State and explain how the final speed of the helium nucleus compares with the final speed of the proton after leaving the region of the electric field. Okay. So basically they're saying if a helium is used over here, for example, we are shooting a helium over here with 2, 4, and proton is basically 1, 1, you can say, because it's just proton. So the mass, you get right as 1, and for helium, you can say that the mass is 4. Let's just write it like this. Mass is 4 and charge per helium will be plus 2 because it consists of two protons which have plus 2 charge and two neutrons and neutrons are neutral charge and protons as we know it's basically just a positively charged. The charge for proton is just plus 1 and for helium charge is plus 2. So basically what will happen we see that the charge of helium is greater than proton also the mass of helium is also greater. But the mass is four times greater and the charge is only two times greater. Okay, so the charge will cause it to get more attracted downward. However, the larger mass will cause the deflection to be lower. Okay, because the mass is larger. So a larger mass cannot travel that fast because it's much more heavier. Okay, compared to a lighter mass. So the mass and charge, the mass is going to counteract because that's although despite the charge being larger or twice the mass is four times as a result the helium will get deflected less okay and over here we can make use of the equation so right here we know as it is moving downward so we can just say that the electric force can be equal to the weight of the helium so 
Uh, over here, we know electric force has an equation of QE equals to mg. Or for weight, you can just directly write mg. And over here, now if we make our... Um, uh, over here, you can also write replace g as a because that's acceleration. So if you make a our subject, we are going to get QE by m. And they have already said that the initial speed is the same. So for example, u for this and u for this both are the same. However, the acceleration, now since the mass is larger, the mass is times 4, uh, and the charge is times 2, as a result, overall, what is happening to the acceleration? The acceleration is actually decreasing because the mass is increasing 4 times. So if we, for example, if we just do a cancellation, so 2, uh, can we can cancel for S2? Okay, so basically, A shall be QE, 2m okay so the mass is decreasing by 2 you can just say overall that is what is the scenario that is going on since the mass is increasing by twice that means the acceleration will get halved and as the acceleration get halved this means that the spinal speed will be will be lower okay spinal speed will be lower all right so since the final speed of the helium will be lower so it's basically say, state and say the final speed of helium. So since they're asking us to compare with the final speed, we are just going to say that the final speed will be lower. Will be lower. Now let's just uh, force on the left. This is that the parallel component of the velocity is the same. However, the acceleration is going downward and this acceleration is actually decreasing because the mass is four times. So overall, it is the effect of mass which is which it is experiencing. So acceleration is decreasing. However, the parallel velocity is the same. And velocity parallel to the plates is the same. Since the initial velocity is the same, so we can also say velocity parallel to the plates is the same. However, the acceleration when this decrease out since there is a larger increase in mass larger increase in mass then charge okay here's what will happen that and here's what will happen since the acceleration is actually smaller since acceleration is smaller Okay, I think we shouldn't use the term decreasing. We shall much rather use is uh, uh, the acceleration gets smaller. That's a better term to use. Okay, because it just gets halved. Okay, so since acceleration is smaller, this means that the final speed will be also smaller or more. Will also be smaller. Or you can say lower. Okay, so that is it for this question. Now, moving on to question number five. It says a capacitor or capacitance 470 microfarad is connected to a battery of electromotive force of 24 volts in a circuit as shown in figure 5.1. So this is the circuit which they have given us. The two-way switch S is initially at position X, P and Q are identical long straight wires. Each wire has a resistance of 5.6 kilo ohms. These wires are placed near to and parallel to each other. Where Q is connected to a voltmeter. Okay, so over here you can see why if you connected to a voltmeter. At time t equals to zero, switch S is moved to position Y so that the capacitor discharges through the wire B. So at time zero, Q this S is connected to wire Y, uh to the part Y, position Y. Okay. First it says calculate the charge Q on the capacitor at time t equals to zero. So over here you can simply apply the formula for capacitance. So we know capacitance is equals to Q by V. So over here, Q is given as Q0. So Q0 is basically C times V. The capacitance is given as 470 microfarad. So 470 micro, if you convert it to normal farads, it shall be 10 to the power minus 6. And the voltmeter. So we need the voltage. The voltage is 24 volts. Okay, so multiply by 24. And this gives us a value of 0 0.01 watt. So 0 0.01 watt. Well, oops. Okay, calculate the current I0 in the wire B at times T equals to 0. So we know V equals to IR. So from here, we know the voltage, we know the resistance. So let's just apply the formula. I equals to V by R. So the voltage is given as 24 volts 
and the resistance of the resistor. Uh, do we have any resistance over here? Let's see. Let's see. Okay, they have said over here the wires. There, there we have poles. So these are identical straight wires with each has a resistance of 5.6 kilowatts. So since it's I not at t equals to zero, so at t equals to zero, over here this is the wire. So that is the resistance we're going to use, which is 5.6 kilowatts. So let's just write 5.6 times into part three. Now, if you input this on your calculator, you're going to get an answer of 4.3 times into the power minus three amperes. Okay. Next word, calculate the time constant tau of the discharge circuit. So we know tau has a formula of T equals to C times R, which is capacitance into the resistance. So the capacitance value is given as 470 microfarads. So 470 times into the power minus six. And the resistance is given as 5.6 times in the power 3, which is 5.6 kilowatts. So if you do this, you're going to get an answer of 2.6 seconds. So the next part, I saw to sketch a line to show the variation with T of current I of B as a capacitor discharges. So we know that there is an equation for the discharge of the capacitor, which is X equals to X bar E to the power minus T by RC. You can find this equation on the first page of your question paper. So if you look here, here's the equation, A equals to X dot E to the power minus T by RC. Over here, you can just substitute the X's as I's. Okay, so if we substitute X as I, so I shall be I equals to I naught minus T by RC. So this is the basic equation for the discharge of a capacitor. Now, basically, the our graph shall be I against this thing, E to the power minus T by RC. So the shape of this graph is basically like this, an exponential curve, which is asymptote to the x axis. I'm trying to draw it. So that is our peak current, and this shall be asymptote to the x axis. And this is basically the shape of the curve. You have to know the shape of this graph, and you can easily answer this question. Okay. Next way, it says explain why there is an induced EMF across YQ when they are doing the discharge of the capacitor. So now over here, if we see that when the capacitor is discharging uh, over here, uh, when we connect S to Y, the capacitor will discharge through this wire B. And once it discharges, there will be a change in current in wire B. So for example, if we consider the direction of the current in this way, so as the correction, the current is moving through wire B. Due to the uh, effect of the current, there, should, there will be a magnetic field set up. Since if we consider the current moving downward and if we apply our right hand rule, then we can see that the direction of the magnetic field will be, let me just place my fingers. Um, the current is basically going in the anti-clockwise direction if we use your right hand rule. Okay, anyways, the direction of the current is not important here. So as the capacitor discharges, there will be a current flowing through this wire. This current is basically going to set up a magnetic field and since it will discharge, as it discharges, we can see the curve. As the capacitor discharges, there is a change in current. The current value of current changes. For example, as time proceeds, the value of current is different at different times. So since the value of current changes, there there will be uh, there will be basically uh, the magnetic flux will uh, there will be cutting of magnetic flux, and this will basically an induce an EMF across wire Q. So that's basically the explanation which we have to write down over here. So first we can write down current in wire B gives rise to a magnetic field, gives rise to a magnetic field. And as current in B changes, as current in B changes, this will cause where this will cause uh, where Q to have a change in magnetic flux because wire Q will cut the magnetic flux of wire P. Okay, so that's what we're going to write down. As time to wire P changes, where Q cuts magnetic flux of wire P. Magnetic flux of wire P. And this basically cutting of magnetic flux causes an EMF to be induced across wire Q. Okay, so this cutting of magnetic Plugs causes 
in deals to your empty knowledge cube. Okay, so that's the explanation which you have to write down for this question to score full marks. Okay, next slide it says on figure 5.3 sketch a line to show the variation of T with wall printer reading V. So basically over here, this is very much similar to the current graph. So if we sketch the current graph over here, so this is the wall printer reading is basically will show the reading of the induced here, which is going to take place. So we have seen the current graph as like this. And since over here, we can see that the current value is changing. And since this is an exponential curve, initially the change is the gradient is much more steeper. Okay, so the gradient is much more steeper. And as it proceeds on toward the end, the gradient becomes less steep, almost asymptotic. So the gradient also almost becomes zero. So over here, so initially this graph shall also be steep and over time the gradient shall decrease and it also becomes sort of asymptotic to the uh, x-axis. So these graphs are pretty much very much similar. Okay, so that is the graph which you have to draw to score marks in part two, be part two of this question, which is basically very much similar graph to the I naught graph. Okay, so that's it. Question for magnetism, uh, electromagnetism. So figure six and one shows a thin slice of semiconducting material of, uh, used in a hall probe, okay. So current I passes through the slice in the direction shown. The slice is placed at, in a uniform magnetic fleet, uh, field of uh, flux density B so that the two sides of the faces are perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay, they have said that two sides are perpendicular to the magnetic field. And a steady ball voltage V H is developed between the blades P, Q, X, Y and S, R, Y, Z. So let's identify the faces. So P, Q, X, Y. So B, Q, X, Y is this space. And S, R, Y, Z is this space. S, R, Y, Z. So firstly, they have said use the letters to identify the faces that are perpendicular to the magnetic field. So over here, basically, you have to uh, use Fleming's left hand rule. So using Fleming's left hand rule, so basically the direction of the current is here. So, so your middle finger will be pointing towards the direction of the current. So this is where your middle finger is pointing. And uh, they have said that the electron electrons are moving uh, are moving toward these two sides. So that's where the direction of the force is. So if we align the finger, your middle finger with the current and your thumb, which is the finger showing force toward any one of these sides. So let's just point it to one of the sides. That's going to show me that, that's going to show that your index finger, which is a uh, finger right next to your thumb, is pointing either up or down. So basically, these are the two faces which you have to mark. So this is one face, which is P, Q, R, S, or, and also uh, if we place on the other side, our finger on the other side, that's going to give us W, X, Y, Z. So these are the two faces we have to write on so basically, if you, for example, uh, as I'm doing it, if I uh, point my thumb to the uh, right, then it's going to give me the upper face. And if I point my thumb to the left, this is giving me the bottom face, which is W, X, Y, Z. Okay, so it's basically W, X, Y, Z. And the upper face is P, Q, R, S. P, Q, R, S. Okay, now the second question is it explain why the stationary hall voltage V, H is developed between the faces PQ, XY and SRYZ. So we know that uh, the current, so magnetic field goes uh, up or down and current goes this way. So these are perpendicular. Also the force is perpendicular to magnetic field at current. Okay, so this has to be maintained for them to develop a whole voltage. Okay, and now uh, we can say that as charge carried to one side an electric field is set up and electric field is set up. So basically what happens over here is that for example, okay, let me remove all these things. For example, if the charge carries are electrons. So for example, the electrons move to one side because uh, the direction of the thumb points to where the electrons are going. Okay, for example, the electrons move on to this side. This means that this side becomes more negative and this side becomes more positive. So due to this difference in charges between two uh, these two plates, an electric field is created. Okay, since an electric field is created, this means that a Hall voltage will be developed. Okay, okay, so basically this is it. So electric field and magnetic forces on the charge carriers are equal and opposite. Okay, 
and hall voltage is steady. So they have said, they have asked us why this is steady. Steady hall voltage occurs when the magnetic field and the electric field balances each other out. That, that is the point where the hall voltage becomes steady. Since they have asked us to define why steady hall voltage, that's why we also have to mention this. That the electric and magnetic forces on charge carriers are equal. Charge carriers are equal. Hence, uh, hence the all voltage, which is basically VH, recovers steady. Okay, so that's our answer to this question. Okay, now moving on. The magnitude of VH, sorry, 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 sorry. The magnitude of VH is given by the equation VH equals to BI by NTQ. Uh, state the meaning of the symbols N, T, and Q. We may refer to the letters in figure 6.1. So N, we know N is basically the number density of charge carriers. So number density of charge carriers. Uh, D is defined as the distance or the thickness, basically. So this is the distance. Um, distance, now what is the distance which is referring to? So T is basically the distance, these distances, which can be SZ or RY or QX or PW. Okay, so we can mention any of these distances. Uh, for example, PW or uh, SZ or Q QX or RY. Okay, why is this the distance? Why is this distance the thickness? So basically an easy way to remember this is whenever, whichever plate the electron is in, so that is the plate which we are going to consider. Uh, since this is, these are the plates in which the electrons have accumulated. So this height is our thickness. This height, this height, this height, and this height. So this is an easy way to remember or answer these questions fast. Okay. Now Q. Q is basically the charge on a charge carrier. On our charge carrier, which can be electrons, which are negative, or holes. It can also be sometimes ions. That's a weird scenario to give, but even that can happen. But anyways, suggest with reference to the equation why the size of material used in the whole group is thin. Okay, so thin is referred to, is directly related to D over here. So try to uh, relate to this equation. In many cases, they also say why a semiconductor use, semiconductor use because semiconductor has a low value of V. So VH becomes height. Over here, they are referring to the thickness. So these sometimes changes from year to year. So since uh, it will be thin material, so the thickness T will be lower. So smaller T means a VH is large enough. And if VH is large enough, then we can uh, measure the VH much more easily. Okay, so large enough to measure. Okay, so first we can write VH is inversely proportional to T. Or we can write it in words. So inversely proportional to T, which is a thickness. And if T is small or thin, as I mentioned in the question, then VH will be large enough to measure. So that's basically for our sixth question. Now moving on to our next question. Netting voltage has a root mean square, potential difference PD of 4.2 volts and a frequency of 50 kilohertz. The alternating voltage is applied across a resistor of resistance 760 ohms. By considering the peak voltage, whether the maximum power dissipated by the resistor is 46 milliwatts. So we know that the equation for power is P equals to IV. Since they have asked us to find out the maximal power distributed, so if we find out P max, this I naught and V naught, we should consider the maximal value of voltage and the maximum value of current. And they have already said that this is the root mean square value a potential difference is given. So we need to find out V naught, which is the maximum voltage. And we know for V naught, we need to make use of another equation. So we know V RMS is equals to V naught by root two. That means V naught is basically V RMS into root two, which is the root mean square voltage. So over here V RMS is power by two. And we're just going to multiply root two with this. And over here, since we do not have any information about current, so we can make use of another equation for power since resistance is given. So you can write V naught square by R. You must use the maximum value of potential difference here. It seems they're asking us about the maximum power dissipated. So if we, the maximum value of voltage, we have found out that it is 4.2 root 2. So 4.2 root 2, we then just square it. And the value of resistance is given as 760 ohms. 
So now if you do this, if you press it in your calculator, you're going to get an answer of 0 0.046 watts, which is basically 46 milliwatts. So it is shown. Okay, the next part. The next part asks us that on figure 7.1, draw a smooth card to show how the power dissipated in the resistor varies between time t equals to 0 and t equals to 40 microseconds, assume p equals to 0 at t equals to 0. Okay, so we are assuming that at t equals to 0, our bar is also 0. Okay, so the starting point is already provided by the question. Next, we somehow need to find out the time period over here. So in order to find out the time period, we can make use of frequencies since they have given us frequency. So the frequency which they have given us is 50 kilohertz. So frequency is 50 kilohertz, which is basically 50 times 10 to the power 3 hertz. Okay. Now, if we find our time period, we know T, which is the time period, is 1 by F, which comes basically from the parallel frequency equals through 1 by T. So T is basically 1 by F. So if you do this, 1 divided by 50 times 10 to the power 3, in putting this in the calculator, uh, I'm getting an answer 2 times 10 to the power minus 5 seconds, since we are considering frequency in parts rate. So it gives us an answer in second. Since the unit is in microsecond, so we can just multiply it into the power 6 with it. So if I multiply it into the power 6 with it, that basically gives us 20 microseconds. So 20 microseconds is for one cycle. Okay, and one cycle, you know, is 360 degrees. Okay, so now we have to draw a smooth curve for the power dissipated in the resistor. And over here, and we have also seen that the maximum power is 46 milliwatts, so 46 milliwatts. So let's just mark 46 milliwatts over here on this graph. So each box there, 10 boxes, which means of 25. So each box says, and so each box says is around 2.5 each. That means for 46, let's just find out where 46 is over here. So, so this will be 51 as 2.5 which use a value of 47.5. This is basically 45. That means the so 46 will be somewhere over here in the middle. So 46 is a maximum value of power. So I'm just drawing a rough line at 46 milliwatts. Okay. So this can be considered as 46. And over here, we're just going to draw a curve. Since the cycle is 20 milliseconds, that means it should be 360 degrees at 20 milliseconds. Uh, sorry, not millisecond, microseconds. Um, so basically, our whole cycle is equal to 360 degrees. So I'm trying to take it to 46. Let's see where the half of 10 lies. We shall be on 5, which is basically here, I think. So that is 1 point. And once again, and we'll be like this and come down to 20. Okay, and these two equates to 360 degree because one cycle is 20 microseconds. Okay, and another cycle will be repeated like this. Okay, carefully. Okay, this is a graph which I drew very roughly. And roughly this sort of shape of the graph will score you the minds in this question. Okay. So basically, the point which they are looking for is they want the peaks to be shown at 46 milliwatts. And then they want this correct sinusoidal shape. And there should be four cycles. Okay. So that's it. And then the next part says, use a line. Use your line in A2 to explain why the mean power dissipated in the resistor is 23 milliwatts. So that's basically where the graph becomes symmetrical. Because that is where the mean power lies. So mean power is basically the average power. We can also do it like this. So the maximum value is 46, the minimum value is 0. So you can just 0 plus 46 divided by 2, and that's just going to give you 23 milliwatts. So that is where the line of symmetry lies. Okay, so that's what we are going to explain. So 23 can be somewhere here, I guess. So if you draw a line at 23, these two parts will be symmetric. Okay, so that's what you have to like. Right, so we can write line is symmetrical about 23 milliwatts since they have asked us to 
use a line in A2. That's why use a line in A2. That's why we're just going to write about the symmetric relationship. Okay, so that's what you have to write. Okay, symmetrical. I think I missed symmetrical about 23 milliwatts. Okay, so that's it. Then the next part says an alternate voltage is now applied to the piezoelectric crystal in air. They say what happens to the air surrounding the crystal. So we know that since this is a piezoelectric crystal, this is from the medical physics part of your syllabus. So you know, oh, whenever an alternating voltage is applied to this crystal, what will happen is that this crystal is going to vibrate because we know the properties of piezoelectric crystal. It can both generate an EMF and also it can vibrate. All right. So whenever an EMF is given to it, it's going to vibrate and this vibration will be in the ultrasound range. Okay. Ultrasound range. So the frequency of this vibration. So frequency of vibration will be in the ultrasound range. Okay. So basically, whenever we apply an alternating PD to a piezoelectric crystal, it will vibrate and the frequency of this vibration will be in the ultrasound range. And since it is in air, what will happen is that since it said that the piezoelectric crystal is in the air, it will also cause the air molecules to vibrate here. This is a different kind of question. So you just have to analyze the scenario which they are given to you. Okay, so basically in the answer, what we'll write down is that an alternating voltage or alternate PD so an alternating PD, or you can write voltage, will make the crystal vibrate. And this in turn will also make the air molecules vibrate. Okay, so this vibration of crystal will also cause the air molecules to vibrate. Air molecules to vibrate and this vibration will be in the ultrasound range or frequency of this vibration is in the ultrasound range. So that's basically what you have to write down to score mites, three mites for this question. So these are the three points which you have to write down. Next right, it says the second piezoelectric crystal is placed in the air near the first crystal, okay? It's in the effect of the surrounding air on the second crystal. Now, since the air molecules are also vibrating right now, for example, the air molecules are vibrating, this vibration will basically, will be transferred to the other piezoelectric crystal. For example, another crystal is over here. So this vibration will move on to this crystal. As a result, whenever this vibration, uh, this crystal uh, experiences this vibration in the ultrasound range, this will in turn generate an EMF because we know a piezoelectric crystal can both generate an EMF and the vibration. This is when a vibration is given to the crystal. So whenever a vibration is given to the crystal, it's going to generate an EMF. And whenever we give an EMF to the crystal, it will vibrate. Okay, so that is basically the property of a piezoelectric crystal. Piezoelectric crystal. Okay, so basically what will happen is that now since the air causes this vibration, this makes the crystal vibrate. So air makes the crystal vibrate, which causes an EMF to be generated across the second crystal. Okay, so that's all you have to write down to score minds. This question, this is just for one way. So that is it for our question number seven. So question number eight is basically from quantum physics. So the first verse says, what is meant by the work function energy of a metal? So we know that work function, this is a minimum photon energy, which is required to remove an electron. You know the equation for energy in quantum, which is energy equals to work function plus Ke max. So this phi is basically our work function. So this is the minimum amount of energy, which is needed to emit an electron from the surface of a metal. Okay. And if we have more energy than the wire function, the rest of the energy will be lost as kinetic energy. So wire function is basically the minimum amount of energy which is needed to remove an electron. Then over here, this type, this energy is basically the photon energy. 
here, this E which you're talking about is a photon energy which can also be written as HF, okay, or HC by lambda. So this is basically the photon energy. Okay, so what is meant by wire function energy? This is the minimum photon energy required to remove electron from the surface. You can write off a metal as well, but these parts are all option. Okay, so it's basically the minimum amount of energy required to remove an electron. If you write this much, you are going to score the mark. Okay, next part, part B, it says ultraviolet radiation has a frequency of 1.36 to the power of 15 hertz incident in vacuum on a metal surface. The power of radiation incident to the surface is 8.36 milliwatts. So this is the power. Photoelectrons are emitted with a maximum kinetic energy of uh, 3.09 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules. So this is our gain max, which is the maximum kinetic energy. Now, uh, in this question, they are asking us to determine the number of photons which are incident on the surface per unit time. So basically, we have to find 1 by t. This per second is a unit of 1 by t, which is the number of photons which is incident on the surface per unit time. So somehow we need to reach to 1 by t. So we know uh, we can equate two equations here. We know power equals to energy by time. Okay. And from here, we can write energy equals to power into time since our power is given. So we can write this equation. Also, we know photon energy is equals to HF. Okay. Which is Planck's constant into frequency. Now, both of these are uh, expressing photon energy. So we can equate these two equations. So Pt equals to HF. Okay. So we need to find out 1 by t. So if we take 1 by t, that means that it will be P by HF. Okay, just by moving the equations, we can find that. So if we take 1 by d like this, that will give us p by hf. Now, if we just substitute the values, we are given the value of p as 8.36. So 8.36, this is in milliwatts, so we need to multiply by tungsten to the power minus 3 in order to bring it to SI units. And h Planck's constant has a value of 1.36, sorry, sorry, 6 point. 6 3 times 10 to the power minus 34. You can find it in the data booklet. And the frequency is given as 1.36 times 10 to the power 15. So 1.36 times 10 to the power 15. So if you put this in your calculator, you're going to get our answer of 9.27 times 10 to the power 15 per second since it's 1 by t. Okay. So this is basically, uh, basically, uh, this is 1 by t, which you need to find out. You can also just take a look at these units to know that this is the number of photons emit a number of photons uh, which are incident on the surface per unit time. Okay, so the answer is 9.27 times 10 to the power 15. Next, it says calculate the wire function energy, phi. So once again, we can use the equation from here. This is our main equation since the kinetic energy maximum is also given. So you can write E equals to wire function plus K max over here, uh, the energy is can be written as HF equals to Y function plus maximum kinetic energy. Uh, our H has a value of 6.63 times 10 to the power minus 34. And frequency, they have given us as 1.36 times 10 to the power 15. And our Y function is what we need to find out. And the maximum kinetic energy is given as 3.09 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules. So 3.09 times 10 to the power minus 19. Now, if we subtract this value from this, then we're going to get a wire function value of 5.93 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules. So it's 5.93 times 10 to the power minus 19. Okay. So all these we are keeping in three significant figures because all the information provided to us are in three significant figures. So you can see kinetic energy is in three significant figures, frequency is in three significant figures, power is in three significant figures. Also the Planck's constant which he uses in three significant figures. So we are going to keep our final answer in three significant figures as well. Okay, next part it says the frequency of radiation incident to the surface, incident on the surface is increased while the power remains constant. State and explain the effect of this change of the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons and the rate of emission of photoelectron. So we just have to take a look at the equation. So we know E equals to y function plus 
k max and e can be written as hf so hf equals to y function plus let's just write kinetic energy so now first question they're asking maximum kinetic energy so they're basically increasing the frequency of radiation and one more important thing is that they have said that the power remains constant okay so these are the two things we have to keep in mind okay so now if we they're asking us first thing about kinetic energy so let's just make kinetic energy our subject k equals to hf minus y function so this y function is going to stay constant because this is constant for a particular type of metal we are increasing the frequency so basically if we increase hf this means that the kinetic energy is also increasing and hf is basically our photon energy okay this means our photon energy is increasing so our kinetic energy will also increase because the frequency is increasing so that's what we have to write in our answer so the photon energy increases as we increase to the frequency hence our maximum <laughs> KD or EK or you can just write full kinetic energy also increases okay so that is the answer to the first word next word says the rate of emission of photoelectrons so they have given us an infor important information that the power remains constant now since the power over here is remaining constant this means that um and and also the photo energy is increasing so hf is increasing because we are increasing the frequency since the photon energy is increasing but the power is the same this is what will happen this means that there will be lower number of photons per unit time okay because the power is the same but more energy is required but we are not being able to provide enough power to it this means that there will be lower number of photons per unit time and since each electron is absorbing one photon you know when the photon is incident each electron absorbs one photon and this electron is emitted so since each electron emits one, uh, absorbs one photon and the photon energy is higher and the power is the same this means that less electrons are going to emit are going to be emitted per unit time so that's basically what we have to write down so this means so basically our answer will be the photon energy is higher but the power is constant or you can write power is same so there will be lower number of photons by unit time number of photons per unit time so each as since each electron absorbs one photon John absorbs one photon so the rate of emission will be lower rate of emission will decrease okay you can just write lower or decreases decreases or you can just write will be lower will be lower okay will decrease or it will be lower okay so that is the answer okay now moving on to question number nine so uh the first verse says state what is meant by the luminosity of the star so this is a direct question which this do, which they ask us so you have to know the definition for luminosity of a star the so luminosity is basically the radiant power emitted by the star so this is the total power of radiation of also you can say power of radiation or radiant power is the same thing so total power of radiation emitted by a star emitted by a star so that is basically the definition for luminosity so you have to know this definition next part it says so this part this, this whole question is from astronomy yeah so next part it says a star in constellation can its measure is in is a distance of 8.14 at central power 16 from earth so this is basically the separation of the star from the earth so we can say it as d and has a luminosity of 9.86 stars into the power of 27 so this is our luminosity l the surface temperature is given as 9830 kelvin okay so we have t we have l and we have d the first verse says calculate the radial flux intensity of radiation from the star observed from the earth giving you two answers so we know radial flux intensity f equals to luminosity by 4 pi d square luminosity is given to us so this is the value of luminosity so luminosity is 9.86 times 10 to the power 27 
and 4 pi and d is the separation which is 8.14 uh, to the power 16 and this is squared now if you input this on your calculator you're going to get an answer of 1.18 times 10 to the power minus 7 so 1.18 times 10 to the power minus 7 since all of these are in three significant figures our answer is also in three significant figures also they have asked us to give a unit so you can directly find out the unit from this equation or you can know the unit which is basically watts per meter or you can just uh, directly find out the unit from the equation so luminosity is basically power so this has a unit of watts also they have given us it has a unit of watt 4 pi is a constant so it has no unit and d has a unit of meter square so it's basically watt per meter square okay so that's the unit so in that way you can just easily find out the unit as well next part it says determine the radius of the star so over here we basically have to make use of Stefan Boltzmann law which is uh, whose equation is also given in the data booklet on the first page of this question paper you're also going to find out this specific equation about Stefan Boltzmann law so L equals to 4 pi sigma r squared t to the power 4 so that's basically the equation which you have to know and over here we have to find out radius so radius will basically be root over L by 4 by sigma t to the power 4 and if you just substitute these values you're going to get the answer all these values are already provided to us so luminosity is given as 9.86 9.86 to the power 27 and this is basically 4 by if you go to the data booklet you are also going to get the value of sigma which is basically 5.67 times to the power minus 8 r squared is r is basically what we are finding and t to the power 4 t is given as 9830 kelvin so 9830 this is to the power 4 so if you put this in your calculator you are going to get an answer of 1.22 times to the power 9 meter once again this shall be in 3 significant figures because all the information on our question is given in 3 significant figures Okay, so that's basically our answer. Next part, it says explain how the surface temperature of the distant star may be determined from the wavelength spectrum of the light of the star. So since they have asked us, they, they have given us that from the wavelength spectrum of the star, this means that we can find out the wavelength of peak intensity from this wavelength spectrum. So whenever they're they are talking about temperature and wavelength, we just have to think back to our Wines displacement law which is basically says that uh, the lambda max or wavelength of peak intensity is inversely proportional to the surface temperature in Kelvin or the thermodynamic temperature at the surface. So basically that's the thing which you have to remember. So basically over here we can say lambda max times t is basically a constant. And uh, basically you have to also make the use of this ratio in many maths problems which are related to astronomy. So you can write say, lambda max into T1 equals to lambda max 2 into T2. So you can also make equations like this and solve. So basically, if we know the wavelength of this star, so we if we are to find the surface temperature, we need to know the wavelength and temperature of another object. And we can just compare them and find out the temperature, uh, which is basically by using this specific ratio. For example, this is the lambda max of the star, and this is the temperature of the star. And for example, we know the lambda max of a known object. And we also know the temperature of a known object. So if we know these values, and we also find out the wavelength max from of the star from the wavelength spectrum, then we can easily find out the temperature of the star thermodynamic temperature by just doing this thing. So lambda max of the object, T of the object, divided by lambda max of the star. So that's basically how we can find out. So that's what we have to write over here, just in words. So wavelength of peak intensity and first needs to be determined from the wavelength spectrum. So first we can write determine the wavelength of peak intensity. Uh, let's just erase this thing. The peak intensity from the wavelength spectrum of the star of the star now we also need to know the wavelength of peak intensity of a known object of a known of an object with known temperature okay so next we can write wavelength of peak intensity from an object of known temperature is also also needs to be determined 
also needs to be determined and then we can apply why is this based on law then we can apply uh wines displacement law okay or you can just write the details of this law which basically states that wavelength of peak intensity is inversely proportional to the thermodynamic temperature this is our thermodynamic temperature okay which is basically at the surface okay you do not have to go to these details but you can just write apply once this space and lock okay and that's basically it for question number nine okay for last question last question says so last question we can see this is from nuclear physics okay so let's read the last question it says carbon 15 is an isotope of carbon that undergoes radioactive decay to nitrogen in 15 and 7 so this is the mass number and this is the proton number or the atomic number then radioactive decay is both random and spontaneous process state what is meant by random so we basically know these are simple definitions which we have to know so random is basically why because we cannot predict which nucleus will decay next or when a particular nucleus will decay both of these was for mind so i'd like i like to write both of them in my answer so random is basically because we cannot predict which nucleus will <laughs> decay next and when a particular nucleus will decay and when a particular nucleus will decay okay so that's basically it Next verse says, what is meant by the term spontaneous? This is because uh, we say radioactive decay is a spontaneous process. This is because it is not affected by any external environmental factors, such as temperature or pressure. Look okay, at so we can just write not, or we can just write nuclear radioactive. So radioactive decay is not affected by the radioactive decay. The case is not affected by any external environmental factors so that is it for this question I, this so it shows a sample of carbon 15 decays the mass m of carbon 15 in the sample decreases with time d show that the variation of d with the value of ln m times n to the power minus 16 so we shall take care of this value because oftentimes people miss this out so please take care and this is against d okay which is time so first part say state how figure 10.1 demonstrates that the radioactive decay is a random process so you can say this is a random process because it shows many fluctuations over here the line is showing many fluctuation which means that that this process is very random okay otherwise uh this line wouldn't have shown this type of fluctuations okay so we can just write line fluctuates as the answer so that's going to score you the mark and then part two it says from figure 10.1 draw a straight line of best fit so over here, we'll just have to take your scale and draw a best fit line across this thing like this. It may not be completely straight, my line, but that's basically how you're going to do it. So place a scale over it since I'm doing it here. So it may not be that accurate, but uh, his line should be roughly like this. So use your scale when you draw this to get a much more accurate line. Okay, since I do not have a scale here, so I'm doing it roughly. Next word, it says show that the decay Boston lambda of carbon 15 given by the magnitude of the gradient of your line. So over here, this graph is basically shows the relationship of ln m against t. So we know the formula for radioactive decay. So this formula, which is n equals to n naught e to the power minus plus lambda t, this can be for any kind of radioactive decay. I think this formula is given on your data booklet as well. So if I am forward so let's just go back and see i think this formula is already given so yeah this thing x they use it by writing x so over here x can be activity x can be the number x can be the mass so you can substitute anything for the value of x whenever radioactive decay is taking place so over here we're just going to substitute it with m okay so m equals to m naught e to the power minus lambda t so if we take ln on both sides, so it's basically ln m equals ln m naught 
minus lambda d because ln e is one and the bar will come be uh, come to the front so that is it so ln m naught minus lambda t and now ln m this is basically the value on the y-axis and we can make lambda d t is the value of x and lambda t is basically our gradient and plus ln m naught which is our y-intercept so from here we can see the gradient has a value of minus lambda since they're asking us as a magnitude of gradient, so magnitude of gradient is basically we do not give any sign for magnitude, so magnitude of gradient is basically lambda. Okay, so this is shell. Okay, so you will have to basically establish this relationship of a straight line and show that the magnitude of gradient is lambda. Okay, so this is the part. Next part says use your line in V2 to determine uh, lambda, give a unit to your answer. So lambda, we know. Uh, we just basically have to calculate the gradient of this graph. So we have drawn a line of best fit. I don't know how accurate this is, but let's just try to find it. So over here at this point, so over here, each of these is 0 0.05, I think, because 5 divided by 10. Yeah, these are 0 0.5 each of these. So this is basically a minus 4 point. Sorry, let's just copy it. This why not? Sorry, these are each 0 0.1 because each uh, there are 10 divisions, 10 divided by 1, oh, sorry, 1 divided by 10 because there are 10 divisions and so each division is basically 1 by 10 which is 0 0.1. So this is basically minus 4.8. Okay, so this value is minus 4.8. Over here it is minus 8. So I'm choosing basically this first one and this last point. Okay, now let's just find the value of t. So over here t is 0. And in fly, the way just see the line is out, but okay. So without the line, because my line is not exactly a best fit, but it will pass through these two points, I believe. So I'm just using the value of this point as well. So over here, you see each of these boxes over here, there are 10 boxes, each is 2 for 10. So 2 by 10 is basically 0 0.2. So 12 minus 0 0.4, that's going to give me 11.6. So this coordinate is 11.6. Okay, now let's just find out the gradient. So gradient equals to del y by del x. So del y over here will be minus 8, and this will be minus, minus 0 0.4.8. So let's just do it. Minus 8 minus minus 4.8 divided by del x. At minus 8, our point is 11.6. So, 11.6. Okay, one more thing. We have seen that over here, this is actually basically the minus of gradient. So, let's just keep a minus sign and have the further. So, this is a negative in the front. Anyways, let's just continue. So, 11.6 and over here, key has a value in 0. So, minus 0. Now, including this on my calculator. I was placing this on my calculator. I get, I'm getting a value of 0 0.27586, something like this. So basically, I'm going to keep it in two significant figures, since this value for, of minus 4.8 is in two significant figures. So 0 0.28 in two significant figures. This is basically 0 0.28, and the unit of lambda is per second, because this is the probability. Lambda is basically long 2 by d half. Long 2 has one unit, and d half has a value of minus second. So, sorry has a value of second and since it is the reciprocal of seconds so the unit is basically s to the bar minus y okay next part which says uh, use your answer to calculate the half-life of carbon 15 so that's basically what we did so we know lambda equals to ln 2 by d half over here we basically use 0 0.693 as the value of not 2 because that's what we are recommended to use divided by t half t half um, we are going to calculate t half, so let's just make t half the subject. So t half is equals to 0 0.693 divided by lambda. So 0 0.693 divided by 0 0.28. Now so if I calculate it, 0 0.693 divided by 0 0.28, that is giving me a value of 2.5 in two significant periods. So it's basically 2.5. Perfect.
Next part of the question, it says the equation for decay of carbon-15 can be written as this. Say then explain the mass of products of the decay must compare with the mass of carbon-15 nucleus. Okay, since carbon-15 is decaying to form these products, this means that the products will have obviously a lower mass than the reactant or than the carbon-15 atom. This is because whenever it decays, it will release some energy. We know E equals to mc square. If you think like this, as energy is being lost or energy is being released from the system, since energy is released when carbon is decaying, so the product must have a mass which is lower because the value of energy is going to decrease. And C is a constant, so M shall also decrease. So we can just equate E is proportional to M. Okay, so if the value of E decreases since energy is being lost or released, that means mass is also decreasing. Okay, so the total mass of products must also decrease. Using this equation, we can directly say this. Okay, so basically what we have to write down is that our first point is for reaction to occur, the energy must be released. For reaction to occur, energy must be released. Okay, and since energy is released, this comes from a total mass, loss of mass, okay, or falling mass. So, energy release comes from fall in mass. So, the total mass of product must be less than the mass of carbon 15. So, the total mass of products must be less than the mass of carbon-15. Okay, so that's it. So that is the end for this paper. If you have any questions, please leave them down below in the comment section below. I will be happy to answer. Okay, goodbye. This was me, Prajanma from Ace Academy. Hope you enjoyed and subscribe to our channel.